We are reading from Srimad Bhagavad Gita, chapter number two, contents of the Gita summarized, text number twenty-seven. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Jatasya He Dhruva Mrityu Dhruvam Janma Mrityasya Cha Tasmat Apariharye Arte Na Tvam Sochitam Arhasi Jatashahi Dravar Mrityur Dravang Janma Mrityash Yucha Tasmandapi Atasmandapariharye Arte Natvang Sochitam Arhasi Jatashahi Dhrivo Mrityur Dhruvang Janma Mrityash Yucha Tasmanda Parihar Yarte Natvang Sochitam Arhasi Jatashya of one who has taken his birth. He certainly Dhruva a fact Mrityu death Dhruvam it is also a fact Janma birth Mrityasya of the dead Cha also Tasmat Therefore, apariharye, of that which is unavoidable, arate, in the matter, na, do not, chvam, you, sochitam, to lament, arhasi, deserve. Translation and purport, by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. One who has taken his birth is sure to die. And after death, one is sure to take birth again. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. Purport. One has to take birth according to one's activities of life. And after finishing one term of activities, one has to die and take birth for the next. In this way, one is going through one cycle of birth and death after another without liberation. This cycle of birth and death does not, however, support unnecessary murder, slaughter, and war. But at the same time, violence and war have inevitable factors in human society for keeping law and order. The battle of Kodakshetra being the will of the Supreme was an inevitable event and the fight for, this, for the right cause is the duty of a Kshatriya. Why should he be afraid of or aggrieved of the death of his relatives since he was discharging his proper duty? He did not des deserve to break the law, therefore becoming subjected to reactions and sinful acts of which he was so afraid. By avoiding the discharge of his proper duty, he would not be able to stop the death of his relatives and he would be degraded due to his selection of the wrong path of action. Bhandeham 
Shri Guru Shri Jata Bada Kamala Shri Guru Vaishnava Shri Rupa Sagrajata Sahagana Ragana Tan Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Deva Shri Radha Krishna Pada Sagana Lali Shri Vishakam Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Svamanitinamine Namaste Sarasvate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvise Sarsunyavadi Paschadya Deshatarine So I remember back in 1971 when I just joined our little temple in Austin, Texas. And then the word came that Prabhupada wanted one devotee from each temple to come to assist him in India. What a great blessing. I, didn't, I wasn't chosen, but my godbrother Dvijahari, he was chosen. There's, you can see the photograph at the... What temple is that? That one temple, where is that? Varadamadar temple, wasn't it? One of the temples there, Baba's sitting there, the Rupa, yeah, the Rupa Goswami Samadhi, yes. Rupa Goswami Samadhi, he's giving the, a whole series, you can hear the recordings, it's so nice, the Nectar Devotion series. <coughs> Prabhupada explained in such detail the science of bhakti. It was the first time he had brought so many devotees here to Vrindavan, so it was a wonderful experience. There was no Krishna Balaram temple. They were just staying at some other ashram, but they were there with Prabhupada. Just imagine. I was just <coughs> thinking as I was beginning this class, what it would have been like to be in there sitting here with Prabhupada in 1971 in Vrindavan and in front of Rupa Goswami Samadhi, hearing Rupa Goswami's teachings. How profound, how deep, how enlivening, how thrilling, how uplifting. So, if we go deep enough, even though Prabhupada is not physically present, you see. If we go deep enough into hearing, chanting, remembering these sublime teachings, we can be in that same wonderful atmosphere with Prabhupada and his disciples. And that day they were at Rupa Goswami's Samadhi discussing the nectar devotion. And we can mystically be transported to that very atmosphere simply by going deep, deep, deep into these teachings. Laying aside all preconceived notions, laying aside all material attachments, our detachments, 
simply try to understand purely what is this wonderful science of bhakti that Krishna is presenting here to Arjuna? How can we understand it perfectly? And how can we meditate on it perfectly? And how can we implement it perfectly? By so doing, we're brought into the association of these great personalities, Srila Prabhupada, Rupa Goswami. Just imagine we could be here in Vrindavan 500 years ago with Rupa Goswami. You see, sitting in his feet and hearing his discourses. By the power of Prabhupada's transcendental words, we can do that. We can be transported to that same atmosphere the devotees experienced with Prabhupada back in 1971. We just have to lay aside all of our ideas preconceived ideas and just hear and understand what does Krishna want of me? What's the, what does Krishna want me to do right now? You see, Krishna is my eternal Lord and Master and I'm His eternal servant so how can I now come back to the perfection of that relationship? So this verse is, and all these verses are to help us come back to that perfection of our relationship. Jivera Sarupahoy Krishnera Nijadas. The constitutional position of the living entity is he is the eternal servant of Krishna. So let us look again at the verse. One who has taken his birth is sure to die. And after death, one is sure to take birth again. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. Well, this, of course, is referring to the body, not to the Atma. We read elsewhere in this same book, For the soul there is never birth nor death, nor having once been does he ever cease to be. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing and primeval. He is not slain when the body is slain. So this is a different perspective. The bodily situation will go through those transformations. You see, boyhood to old, youth to old age. That is going on. The change of body is happening at every minute. In fact, the body you have now, sitting here hearing this class, is not the same body you had when you walked in to sit down to hear this class. Because at every moment the old blood corpuscles are dying and new blood corpuscles are taking their place. So you're transmigrating right now during the middle of this class. We're all transmigrating. In fact, we're switching bodies with each other. I'm inhaling, we're inhaling and exhaling and you know, actually switching bodies with each other. Just by sitting in the same room, we're changing molecules, switching molecules with each other. So that change of body is going on perpetually. And it doesn't mean the self is annihilated, but we are getting the reactions for what we're doing. If you engage in pious activities, then you're elevated within the material world. If you engage in impious activities, you're degraded within this material world. And if you engage in transcendental activities, which are beyond piety, you enter into the spiritual world. So what we're learning from our beloved founder Acharya, his divine grace, Om Vishnu Pad Paramahamsa Parivajraka Charja Astatara Shadashi Srimad A.C. Bhaktivedanta Tri Dandi Goswami Maharaj Prabhupada And the predecessor of Charyas is how to think, speak and act in every situation that is totally, fully pleasing to Guru, Vaishnavas and Krishna because such perfect behavior, if we can master the art a perfect mind, perfect speech and perfect actions if we can master this art we're already liberated, even within this present body and upon leaving this body we won't take birth again 
unless you're being asked to come back on a preaching mission. You see, that could happen. It's like we say every morning, Janme Janme Prabhu say, Prabhupada, you're my Lord, birth after birth. So if Krishna wants me to take birth again to preach Krishna consciousness, that's as good as being back to home, back to Godhead. Isn't it? If one dies as a pure devotee and Krishna says, I have some important work for you, I want you to take birth again to help make, bring the fulfillment of Lord Chaitanya's prediction, you see. That in every town and village, you see, this movement will spread. So if we were to take birth again for preaching, that would be as good as being back in Krishna's pastimes. And if you take it a step further, if we can just fully enter the preaching right now, giving up all sense gratification, fully absorbed in pure mood of serving and loving and preaching right now, that's as good as being back to God at right now, sitting here in this room, you see. We can be as good as being back to home, back to God, and right here, right now, just by totally embracing the mood of devotional service. Sense gratification? Well, only what is necessary to keep body and soul together, you see. That's my quota, isn't it? So if I learn how to engage these senses in the service of the master of the senses, Krishna, you see, Rishikesha Rishikena Sevanam then I will enter into that spiritual dimension right here, right now. I don't have to wait for death to go back to Godhead. As Prabhupada told me directly in one letter, he said, now you just qualify yourself to see Krishna face to face. So Prabhupada was talking about in my present body, you see. He's saying now. <laughs> so we, we have to do that, you see. That's what Prabhupada wants us. He wants us all to become pure devotees, not to hang on to the, uh, you know, karma, mishra, bhakta platform, mixing devotional service with Krishna consciousness. I mean with uh, sense gratification. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Why do we want to mix sense gratification with devotional service? Does it make any sense? Why would we want to drink poison? Why would we want to mix, put some poison in the sweet rice? <laughs> Krishna consciousness is the sweet rice and sense gratification is the poison. So why would you want to put some poison in the sweet rice? Just take pure sweet rice. You see. That's intelligence. So by understanding what our, the situation Arjuna was in is described here and learning from how Arjuna handled the situation in such a way that Krishna was pleased with them, we can also become masters of our own fate. You understand? Some sometimes said that man is the architect of his own destiny. So the fact is each one of us are creating our future right now. Just by our mental attitude, by the things we say and the things we do, we are creating our future. So what kind of future do you want? You see? So we have to understand what kind of future is actually to our advantage. And then we have to actually think, speak and act in such a way that will actually create that future for you, for ourselves. You see? So this process is very effective. Arjuna was able to how can I execute this duty? It will ruin my sense gratification. As when Godfather said, if I kill all my relatives who lied, who lied right over the palace on the weekend. <laughs> you, see. you see. Krishna had some sense of wanting to enjoy that bodily relationship. His kinsman. But now he's being asked to give it up. And it was heavy for him to do that. He was feeling attached, materially attached. But after hearing the Bhagavad Gita, you see, in the beginning he said, No, I shall not fight. I can't do it. I just can't do it. 
Like a devotee get up in the morning, I just can't chant japa, you know. And Arjuna put his bows and arrows down, the devotee just puts his bead bag, and I can't chant japa. It's like Arjuna putting out his bow and arrows, putting down the bead bag. He said, I just can't do this. He said, I can't do it. It's like Arjuna, you see. So just Arjuna heard the Bhagavad Gita and got the encouragement and the strength, the determination, the enthusiasm, got all the qualities that could pull him out of the lower modes and bring him to the transcendental platform. If we will also carefully hear and understand what Krishna is saying, then we will also be pulled out of the modes. I don't feel like getting up for Mangalarti. I don't feel like strictly following the regulated principles. Can I bend them a little bit? You see. You see. If we just understand what Arjuna, the situation he was in, that bewildering, confusing, perplexing, miserable condition Arjuna found himself in, and how he got out of it, that will liberate us also. Because we also experience perplexity, disappointment, confusion, depression. We go through those things psychologically. You see. So just Arjun, as Arjun conquered them by just saying, Okay, Krishna, you just tell me what you want me to do. That's it. I'm ready. You see. We have to take that same mood as Arjun. My dear Krishna, whatever you want. Now I'll just do it. That's it. It's interesting to note that even Lord Jesus taught the same principle. In the book of John he says, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. The Christians don't understand it. You see? But actually Jesus is teaching the same principle of the Bhagavad Gita. And Hindus don't understand it either. I just got an email from a Hindu gentleman B.S. Murti. I think B.S. was kind of appropriate initials for this gentleman. <laughs> he has given his own edition of the Bhagavad Gita. He said, in the Bhagavad Gita there is wheat and there is chaff. In other words, a lot of stuff is relatively needed in the Gita, so he decided to, you know, clean it out of the unnecessary verses. Like 934, Manmana Bhagavad Gita. He decided to eliminate 934. He's going to make a new improved Gita by you know, cutting out a lot of verses, rewriting all the verses. It was horrible what he did. He wrote me, he wanted me to appreciate um, his Bhagavad Gita. I really led into it. I said, you sh this is an offense against Krishna. You should take it off the market immediately. I chastised him very heavily, you see. He said, can't we just be peaceful? He, said, he wrote back. <laughs> The thing is, we have to understand Bhagavad Gita as it is, you see. If we try to understand it according to our own interpretation, we are just cutting ourselves off from Krishna. This rascal, Dr. Radha Krishnan, who had a very popular edition of the Gita in India, he said, it's not the Krishna that we should surrender, but to the unborn, the unmanifest, that is within Krishna, that's within you, that's within me, that's within everything. That's what we should render to. Just see the rascal. Krishna said, they say not to Krishna, you see. Just see this nonsense going on. We are so fortunate that this great personality has come and given us Bhagavad Gita as it is, you see. Before I came, I had read two other Gitas. They didn't make me devotees. You see, there's so many Gitas. But when you finally found, finally find the real Bhagavad Gita by the pure devotee of Krishna, with elaborate purports to help you understand the, the import of the inner meanings of the verses, and, and you understand it and you apply it, then you can have the most wonderful transformation of consciousness. You can become a spiritually enlightened being, realizing your eternal, all blissful, all knowledgeable nature, qualitatively one with the Supreme Person. 
You can come out of the pains of bodily misidentification and relish your eternal identity as that subordinate servant of Krishna. Krishna is so amazing. <coughs> simply wants to reciprocate love with all of us. That's all he... Krishna doesn't want to lord it over us. He wants to have loving reciprocation with each and every one of us. That's his desire. Okay. We have to understand Krishna as he is. We can't invent our own Krishna. You have to take him as he is, not as you think he should be. You have to take Krishna as he is. You see? and love him as he is. You see. <clears throat> and when you do that, Krishna will reciprocate with you. He says, Yeyata mang prapadyante tang tataya bhajam yaham ama ma dhanne martane munusha pratasara vashaha As all surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects of Sanaprita. You may say, well, how is everybody following Krishna's path? How can you say that? All these karmis, the meat eaters, and sex mongers are following Krishna's path? Yeah, they're following the... <coughs> it's like the government has the, the... There's the place for the free citizens and the place for the criminals. Everybody has to follow the state. Everyone follows the laws of the states. Those, those who do it voluntarily are free citizens. Those who don't want to do it voluntarily, they're forced to do it in the prison. So everybody's following the government. So in the same way, everybody's following Krishna. But you have your choice. How you want to follow him? In a loving, in a sweet, loving mood of intimate relationship? Or as a prisoner within the modes of nature? You see? Either way, you're going to follow him. Follow the laws of the prison? birth, death, old age, and disease, or follow him in, in a loving relationship. Well, he, he even will put himself subordinate to you. You see, just like he subordinated himself to Arjuna, became the chariot driver. He subordinated himself, subordinated himself to Mother Jasoda, became the chastised little kid that Mother Jasoda, because he relished her loving feelings for him, expressed in that amazing rasa. You see? So why should we cheat ourselves? That's my that's my question. <laughs> why should we be so stupid to go on cheating ourselves by remaining in this bodily conception? Why aren't we liberated souls qualified to see Krishna face to face? Because we're still holding on to the false conception I'm enjoying separately from Krishna. You understand? We're still holding on to that false conception of trying to enjoy separately from Krishna. But we can't do it. I don't know why we keep trying. <laughs> We're so stubbornly trying to enjoy separately from Krishna. And that keeps us bound up. Well, I'm this. I'm a 70-year-old man or I'm a 30-year-old woman or whatever, you know. False identification. So it's time to wake up, y'all, as we say in Texas. <laughs> time to wake up. Time to count it out of the illusion of being the center of the universe. We are not the center of the universe. Lord Krishna is the center of this universe, all universes. He is the center of all existence. So when we learn how to dovetail our thoughts, our words, and our deeds with Him, in all times, places, and circumstances, even analyzing my own thoughts, being introspective, am I thinking right now in such a way that Krishna is pleased Krishna knows what we're thinking at every minute. You can't ever hide from Krishna. He knows every thought that goes through your brain. Every thought. So we should be introspective. Am I thinking 
in such a way right now that Krishna is smiling or he's frowning. Why is that rascal thinking like this again? He's getting lusty, he's getting angry. Why is he thinking this way? You see. We have to learn how to reciprocate because Krishna is right there with us at every minute. We have to learn how to ex show our love for Krishna, even how we think about everything, you see. Because when you, once we start doing that, of disciplining our mental, act, our mental, our thoughts, you see, then we can become tightly packed up with Krishna 24 hours a day, <coughs> relishing the sweetest nectar at every minute in all times, places and circumstances. Wouldn't you like to feel that? Wouldn't you like to <coughs> taste the sweetest nectar at every minute? Well, we can do that. It's simply a matter of mental discipline. I have to be introspective. I have to know what the teachings are by reading these books of Srila Prabhupada. I have to know what my attitude should always be in every situation and I have to discipline myself. You see, the mind is one element, the intelligence is another one. Prabhupada says the intelligence, he put the two fingers together like this, is the next door neighbor of the soul. You see? So your intelligence is almost spiritual, not quite, but almost. And if you base your intelligence on these teachings, it's a spiritualized, a powerful spiritualized intelligence. And with that spiritualized intelligence, Prabhupada said the intelligence is like the mother, the mind is like the child, you see. So if you hear Bhagavad Gita, carefully study Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, read all of Prabhupada's books again and again and again, trying to master your understanding of what how I'm supposed to be thinking about everything, you see. And when you have the understanding of what, of what you're supposed to, how you're supposed to be thinking, you can observe your mind and see whether it's on the track or not. And when it's not on the track, get it back. Okay, mind. Yato yato nishchalati manlas chanchalamashtaram tatas tato nayam yatat atmanyay vivyasham yet, Krishna says. From whatever and wherever the mind wanders, due to its flickering and unsteady nature, one must certainly withdraw it and bring it back under the control of the self. So in this way, this is called yogi. You see? The one who controls the mind, they're called yogi. You see? So if we learn to control the mind like that, we'll never be disturbed. We'll always be, we'll be able to see how the loving hand of Krishna is blessing me at every minute in all situations. I'm always being blessed by Krishna's loving mercy, you see. That vision, when you develop that vision, which it comes by seeing everything through the eyes of the scripture. When you develop that vision, you never be disturbed ever again. Your mind will always be peaceful, you see, equipoised. It doesn't mean you, um, you just become uh, like, uh, you know, whatever you say is okay. No. You become a fighter also against nonsense. Uh, Prabhupada told us, <coughs> we, he, he said, he had, he, he said, uh, he described what he called Digvijaya, conquering Panda. Uh, someone says there is no God, Prabhupada said, this is how you respond. Who are you, say, who are you who say there is no God? Come on. Like that. That is Digvijaya, you see. Equipoise doesn't mean you're not a fighter for preaching, you come very strong, you see. Within your heart you're completely peaceful, but for preaching you become like fire, you see. He said like that. Yeah. When someone says there is no God, who are you who say there is no God? Come on! That prophet said those exact words, come on, like that. That is Digvijaya, you see. His prophet said, go town to town, village to, till village, to village, 
and they make dig vijay that there is God, I can prove there is God, who are you who say there is no God? Come on, that is Igvijay. I remember the whole quote now. <laughs> Prabhupada told us to be like that. Digvijay Pandit. So you, within your heart you're very peaceful, totally peaceful. But when it comes to the atheists and the sex mongers and the cow killers and the child rapers and all this stuff going on, it's like fire. A fighter for Krishna. You see. Like Prabhupada, you see. You should see. The devotees couldn't understand Prabhupada's transcendental anger. There's a famous university in the U.S., MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a very materialistic place. So Prabhupada was doing a program there in the early, early days of this kind. And one Indian came forward and he was um, an impersonalist. He said, Swamiji, it's all one. So Prabhupada grabbed his shirt <laughs> and he was shaking. He said, if it's all one, why don't you wear a cotton ball? Devotees couldn't understand. They said, oh no, Swamiji is getting mad. Call the cab. We've got to get him out of here. Devotees couldn't understand that heavy preaching of Prabhupada, you see. But later on we learned. He trained us. We understood. That yes, a devotee can come very heavy for preaching. You see. Doesn't mean he's losing his, his, he's losing his temper. He's using... There is anger can be utilized in the service of Krishna, you see. It's a tool for preaching and it's a teaching tool. You use anger as a teaching tool. You're not overwhelmed by anger, but you use it for teaching. Prabhupada showed us again and again, you see. He would show great anger sometimes, great, great anger, you see. That, that, was, that was good for us. It helped us to become sober and Stop our foolishness, you see. I mean, Prabhupada get angry at us, you see. So, anyway, we've kind of rambled on here for a while. we got five minutes left. Anyone have any questions? Yes. And you're next. I'm a little, my hearing isn't so good. Maybe somebody can repeat what he says. No, the fan is whirling and... <laughs> I'll try to understand. Let me let me give it a try here. That's what separates the men from the boys, as we say, you see. The neophytes from the advanced devotees. In a very provoking, disturbing situation, how do you keep your cool? Well, Prabhupada ordered us to keep our cool, that's one thing. He said, reply with a cool head. Prabhupada told us to keep cool. See, remember, Prabhupada wants me to keep cool, that's one thing. Never to become overwhelmed by anger. See. If you remember that, this, and you understand that's for your own benefit, number one, it'll, it's, it'll please Prabhupada if you do that, and you keep your cool. Number two, it'll benefit you also. Because <coughs> if you keep your mind on track, that means you're going to make steady progress. If your mind goes off the track, and you start doing offenses, you start breaking principles, then you, you become miserable, really. So they have an old saying, what's in it for me? If you learn the art of disciplining your mind, you'll, you'll find great peace of mind and happiness. It comes gradually. 
Krishna says, as they surrender on me, I reward them accordingly. To whatever degree you master the art of keeping your mind in control, to that degree you'll feel ecstatic. So how ecstatic would you like to be? A little bit ecstatic or unlimitedly ecstatic? Would you like to have a, vol a volcanic eruptions of ecstasy in your heart at every minute? You see? It's available if we learn the art of keeping that mind always fixed in Krishna consciousness. So we have to understand the great benefit of mental discipline. And sure, we, we mess up. We mess up again and again, sure. Let's admit it, right? But a little kid, does he walk for the first step or does he fall down for a while before he learns to walk? You see, we're like little kids right now in devotional service. We're learning how to walk. Sometimes we slip, whoop! I really blew it. Well, let me try again, you see. The parents encourage the little kid, come on, Amit, you can do it. Get up, you can do it. Keep crying. They encourage the little Amit, and one day he walks very nicely, and he, ah, oh, he's smiling real big, and all the family is in ecstasy. Oh, look, he's walking now. Wow, everybody's in bliss. So we can do that spiritually also. Right now is neophytes, and whoop, boom, you see. But the spiritual master is there, the senior devotees are there, our peers are there, even the juniors are there. They're all encouraging us, you see. They're encouraging us. Come on, you can do it. You can follow this process strictly and relish the sweetest nectar. I mean, it's really a, a sweet process. Huh? In the material world, what's the, most what's the number one pleasure in the material world? Sex, right? But you know what? Hare Krishna is better than sex. Krishna Gandhi is better than sex. If you master the art of being Krishna conscious, it's better than having sex at every minute. So, who, so therefore one can easily be a brahmachari. Once he learns how to be Krishna conscious, he can be a brahmachari, brahmachari, grahasta brahmachari, you know, fixed in following the principles. Because Krishna conscious is more blissful than sex. So it's, it's just a matter of tuning in, turning on, and blissing out, really. You just got to, just like when you want to listen to radio, of course we don't listen to the radio, but you know, when you, you want to tune in, it's a mundane example, you, you hear that radio station, you tune in. You got to tune in right to the, otherwise you, if you're not tuning, you get, ex, you get static. Static is not ecstatic. But when you're tuned in, it's ecstatic, you see. So we neophytes, we're not perfectly tuned in to Krishna consciousness, we get so much static instead of ecstatic, you see. But gradually, if we will learn the art, when I was a kid, my dad had an FM radio and he had a tuning knob and a fine tuning knob off of the stereo files where you could just really zero in, size, do the most subtle little uh, adjustments, the fine tuning knob. So, we have our, in Krishna Gans, we have our tuning knob and our fine tuning knob. The tuning knob is 16 rounds in the, regu in the regulated principles. The fine tuning knob is the Nam Aparaz. We tune in by chanting 16 rounds at least every day and avoiding illicit sex, meeting, intoxication, and gambling. And we fine tune the consciousness by now perfecting my chanting, that there's not even the slightest tinge of an offense in my, in my... It's not only when you're chanting, you see. The non aparads are operating... That principle applies 24 hours a day. This like to be offensive toward devotees. You say, well, I didn't... I wasn't offensive while I was doing my rounds, so it was okay. No. The non aparads are, in, are, in, are applicable 24-7. We have to always be avoiding the nam aparads at every minute. You see? So that's that's the fine tuning now. So our time is just about up. I, maybe I can make a quick. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, You are mentioning that just like Arjuna, Arjun was in a situation where he 
in front of surrender to Krishna and uh, followed the message of Krishna. So similarly, we should also surrender and know what Krishna wants us to do. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, in our case, Krishna is not personally present in front of us. So, how do we really come to know what is Krishna? Krishna? What? How do you know what Krishna wants you to do? Well, that's the spiritual master is there. Spiritual master is present. When you get initiated, your Guru Maharaj is present on the planet. And you can you get direct instructions. You, your spiritual master is giving lectures and they apply to you. Um, that's the easy way. Just like Prabhupada, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati gave many disciples the order to spread Krishna consciousness to the English speaking world. But Prabhupada didn't say, well, that everybody's getting that order. No, he took that as his personal responsibility. He was also told personally to do it as well. So the thing is, uh, take advantage of your spiritual master. Uh, you can ask him directly. In a class or a letter, Guru Maharaj, what do you want me to do? You see, you can ask him directly. I, I took advantage. When I joined anybody in the whole movement could write Prabhupada a letter. Wow! Anybody in the whole ISKCON. In fact, one time I asked Vishnu John Swami, who was our leader in Austin, a question. He said, I don't know, why don't you write Prabhupada? Wow, what a great opportunity to write Prabhupada a letter. But then about it, three or four months later, they said, now only the, see, the only the temple presidents in GBC you should write Prabhupada a letter. I was going, oh. But I was, um, I was pretty uh, enthusiastic, <laughs> you could say enthusiastic to get that association. I took a chance and I wrote Prabhupada a letter in violation of the policy. But I didn't put my name on the return envelope, so it'd be open, but they wouldn't know who it would come from. And Prabhupada wrote me back, he answered my question nicely, and then he reminded me of the policy. But then, you know what? And he said, but if there's any urgent matter, I'm always happy to hear from my beloved disciples. Prabhupada gave me a loophole. I had a loop, I was an official policy, nobody can write unless you're a GBC or Temple President or Sanyasi, but I had a direct loophole, a direct permission to prop and I could write if I had an urgent matter. Wow. See, I took a chance and I wrote a letter and I got the mercy. By being aggressive like that, I got the mercy. I got a special exemption of the policy directly from Srila Prabhupada himself. Wow. And I took advantage of it too. <laughs> I wrote quite a few letters, but I got to the, I knew that Prabhupada preferred I not do that unless I had an urgent need. So unless I had an urgent need, I didn't do it. I followed Prabhupada's instruction. And I got to a point where I didn't need it anymore. And I was happy. I could just, you know, hear the lectures and uh, hear the, the tape ministry came out. We could hear the, you know, could take notes off the tapes. So I learned I didn't need to do that finally. but. I took advantage of that opportunity to, to get direct personal instructions in me. And those personal instructions are a great treasure. I still have all the original letters. And they're my greatest treasure. I got that sign that right there, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami and the pen. Those are the greatest treasures, you see. So take advantage by your Guru Maharaj is here. If you need some personal instruction, go for it. Take advantage of that, you see. It's just even one word directly from your spiritual manager can completely transform your eternal existence. It's that powerful. Okay? Anything else? Maybe one more. I have a hand somewhere. If there's no hands, we'll stop here. And we thank you all so much for coming today. May you all be blessed with all we have prasadam for you, by the way. Don't go away. We have prasad, Vadadamara Maha prasad for you. Wow. So everyone come forward now and we thank you so much for your being here today. May Sri Rupavad bless you all with Prima Bhakti. Hare Krishna. Okay, here we go. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, I never got a word. Huh? Huh?